Muy buenos días a todos y todas. Vamos a dar unos minutos de espera, un par de minutos de espera mientras. Eh, la... Good morning, one and all. We will give a couple of seconds until the other participants are online. Welcome, one and all. Good morning, one and all. We will give a couple of moments while other participants get online and we'll get started in a few minutes. Good morning, one and all. Welcome everyone to this web seminar on key messages for shelter management. I 
M. Dana Barron with a sectorial coordination and shelter management for Latin America and the Caribbean with the International Federation of the Red Cross and the LGTV plus human mobility. We have organized this webinar we will be conducting today. So welcome everyone. I would like to confirm if everybody can hear me okay. So we'll get started with some initial considerations. You will have interpretation available to English on the right lower corner in your screen. There is an icon with the globe you will find there. All microphones will be muted. They will only be opened at the end of the webinar for the Q&A session. We will have a specific space for questions and comments. Please share any questions you might have via chat. These questions will be sent to the panelists with whom we will be sharing today. So they're answered at the end of our webinar. The webinar will last an hour and a half and we are recording it in English and Spanish and it will be shared with the participants. So via chat, we will be sharing a list so that you can register yourselves so we can have your personal information in order to send out materials and complimentary information for those of you that participate in this webinar. On one hand, we would like to share with you that this webinar has been jointly organized between these two red lag uh, tables. Red lag is the group that manages emergencies and humanitarian crisis for Latin America and the Caribbean, led by OSHA as the humanitarian agency. After a series of training courses that the shelter coordination table did, we identified it was necessary to open a specific space to speak about gender issues on how to incorporate a gender-based approach, what experiences we have in terms of gender in managing and coordinating shelters and how we can incorporate this approach in managing shelters. That's how this initiative arose of having this space. So in this webinar, we would like to reach three specific objectives. On one hand, that we can channel all the differentiated gender impacts we need to bear in mind when managing shelters. Also, we will talk about some key aspects, as you can see on the first part of the webinar. Some of the objectives of the webinar is that we can share best practices for integrating gender. We will have the participation of the LGBT plus network of organizations that have been working on human mobility with refugees as well as migrants. We will present the panel members. We have this um, in this network, a special guest. We will be sharing with the International Migration Organization some best practices. As I said, that's one of the objectives of this webinar. And we will share recommendations, tools that will be very useful to incorporate a gender-based approach in our activities. We will be talking about women and children, but also on LGBT plus people during the webinar. I would now like to yield the floor to Nicolas. He is an officer for IMO and he's a coordinator of the sectorial table for managing and coordinating shelters. Thank you very much, Dana. I will be very brief simply to thank all the colleagues that are accompanying us in the different webinars we have been carrying out throughout the year to thank the gender table specifically and UN Women for facilitating this session and allowing us to participate and reinforce the commitment the CCCM has in Latin America and globally to continue working for in the inclusion of a gender-based approach in all the activities of the sector. So thank you for being present. 
welcome you once again, those that have been participating before and the newcomers as well. So let's continue with the presentations. We hope they're useful and don't forget to leave your questions on the chat room and any concerns you might have that we don't cover in the sessions to organize ourselves better for the future. Thank you, Dana and colleagues and all the participants. Thank you, Nicolas. So now I'll introduce the people we will be carrying out the agenda we have programmed for today. In the first part, we will talk about key concepts, some differentiated impacts by Nuria and uh, Nuria Martin. She's a coordinator of peace and security on the UN Women Office. We will have Flavia Masencio. She is part of the regional network for protecting LGBT plus in mobility situation in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is one of the special guests we have today. We will have in the second part sharing experiences and best practice for integrating gender in shelters. Amalia Torres, she's the focal point of the project for women participation in the global cluster. She's part of the International uh, Migration Organization. And from IMO, we will have Belen Rodriguez. She's a coordinator of protection for this UN agency. We will also have Denise Solis. She's senior officer for shelters and emergency from the International Federation for the Red Cross, the IFRC, and we will have Wilson Castañeda. She is he's part of the G LGBT plus network. On the third part of our webinar, we will talk about some tools and reach some key conclusions. We will have Evelyn Vallejo. She's regional advisor for gender and protection from the IFRC. And once again, we'll have Nuria Martin from UN Women. She will be sharing these tools and we'll have a space for questions and answers. I will be the moderator and we will close jointly with Nicolas. Now I would like to yield the floor and welcome our colleagues Nuri and Flavia for the first part on gender keys. Welcome everyone. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me well? Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dana, for your opening remarks. Thank you, Nicolas. Welcome one and all. Welcome all those that are present. Let's get started very briefly, talking about some very basic concepts on gender and differentiating, uh, differentiated impacts on shelter coordination. My brief introduction would be that we have to be aware that inequalities at all levels are exacerbated during emergencies, during disasters, or any crisis that can arise, such as the case of COVID. And gender inequalities are particularly affected, as well as vulnerabilities in these situations. And at the same time, women and girls are the persons that are most affected by these discriminations and inequalities are also the people who usually respond first in affected communities, usually before international aid arrives or emergency assistance, they're the first caregivers and they are more impacted in that sense. Next slide, please. We can also mention stereotypes and gender roles and how they affect in managing and coordinating shelters. Stereotypes are preconceived ideas, social constructs that attribute differentiated characteristics according to gender. In this sense, a stereotype would be to think, for example, that women are more sensitive, that they have a greater capacity to show empathy and to care for others, that men are the ones that have physical strength and the ones that should play leadership roles. Gender roles are how these stereotypes are expressed, the expected behavior by society that's socially affected for women and girls differentiated from boys and girls in that sense. These stereotypes and these roles vary in a given society or community, depending 
on the different factors of said community. This influences in shelters and in temporary accommodations because oftentimes there's a reproduction of these traditional roles. For example, a caregiver role is assigned to women. These carry out these tasks, such as caring for the small children, cooking or house chores. And in the case of men, the activities that require more physical strength are delegated to them. And our role as people that manage shelters is to try not to have these roles uh, reproduce. So they limit the possibility for action of each person to consider individual capabilities and not traditional roles. On the next slide, we can see some of the impacts that have been identified in some shelters on specific risks women and girls can suffer in a shelter. In this sense, we have seen that they have a greater role for being victims of gender-based violence on sexual abuse and exploitation, and they also have a limit to access and participation in decision-making and coordination processes. Another type of impact more related to protection is the lack of privacy in restrooms, in bathrooms, in sanitary facilities. Of course, like we mentioned before, an increase in the burden of caregiving and a topic that affects women specifically and girls is the lack of efficient services for sexual and reproductive health. There are many more impacts, but these are the major ones that have been affected and that vary according to the shelters, of course. On the next slide, we mention what would be or how we would like to underscore the importance of managing shelters with a gender-based approach to be aware of these traditional roles, of these stereotypes, and to try to not reproduce them so we don't limit the individual capacities. In this sense, it's very important to promote the dignity of all the individuals that live in a shelter so that the shelter is safe for each and every person, because usually it's not only women and girls, the persons that have a greater risk or that are more discriminated to say it somehow, but there are different groups that are traditionally been affected and that have other specific roles pertaining protection. So in this sense, it would be important to foster individual autonomy, the capacity for recovery and reconstruction of the community in a more equitable and just way, and also to foster a sense of belonging. And finally, to eliminate all gender barriers In order, sorry, in order to have an ideal shelter, a more equitable one, we have a series of tips, advice, very simple ones. There are more in greater detail, but at least initially, these are some very simple tips on how to achieve safer and equitable shelters. For example, at the moment of the reception, the registration forms or the mechanism is equally accessible. For example, the levels of literacy have to be taken into account. Any personal document, the attention for minors and access should be equal for all. It's also very important that consultations and information be asked equally to men and women. We shouldn't assume when there's a family that we should only ask the male member. Both members of the family should be asked similar questions. Organize the work in the shelter in order to guarantee that the design of programs prioritize the needs of all the groups in a balanced manner and that all groups are benefited. And of course, to be very alert to any safety issues that might arise, particularly care and risks 
on uh, gender-based violence and sexual exploitation, which is a recurrent issue. Finally, on my side, I wish to leave you with some different tips of what each member of the, of the team, according to their roles, to guarantee that the activities implemented in the shelter promote gender equality in order to be able to better reconstruct. And with this, I now hand the floor to my colleague Flavia from the network. Hello, good morning. I don't know if you're able to see my slides. I don't know if um, you can see my video, my but I think you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you perfectly well. Let me assign you as a co-host so you can share your screen. Well, in the meantime, I'll introduce myself. Yes, Flavia. Yes, now you're a co-host too. Great, then. My name is Flavia Masencio. I'm the president of the Argentine Federation of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Trans, and we are part of this regional network for protection to LGBTQ plus people in situation of human mobility in Latin America and the Caribbean. 18 organizations are currently members in this region of our network. And to complement what Nuria mentioned with regard to gender stereotypes and gender roles, this perspective and gender keys we would like to share in this webinar is timely and we should continue looking into it and I'll go deep into the axis of the different topics that have to do with the LGBT plus um, population and the work we do from our organizations. Next slide. Sexual diversity, as well as gender, like Nuria explained, we are part of a collective group of people historically discriminated and vulnerable. This is both worldwide as well as regionally. At a global level, we're told that these are new rights. This is something new to talk about sexual diversity. It's not new. We've existed since humanity exists. What is something new is the fact that many years or in recent years, the recognition of our rights in equality have been acknowledged. At a global level, there are different countries in the region where there are equal marriages or legislation for gender equality or specific legislation around the topic of um, discrimination or hate crimes. There's still an unequal map in the region in Argentina, we are still seen as a country, one of the first in the region with uh, equal marriage and a very modern legislation in the perspective of human rights. But when we see the registers of hate crimes that at a biannual level are reported in Argentina, it's still alarming to see on one side advanced legislation and hate crimes that are so relevant currently. There are concepts, next slide please. There are key concepts that have to do with diversity, sexual diversity. What does LGBT mean and from where do all this uh, violence and discrimination suffered by the LGBT community come from? Nuria spoke about the patriarchal structure behind 
discrimination and oppression suffered by uh, gender and girls and adolescents in terms of sexual diversity, particularly when we speak about LGBT, it's not more or less than to talk about our identities and differences and where do these oppressions come from? This is an important parting or starting point to see how we can reverse this discrimination and violence. Basically, we need to know and understand each other and key concepts regarding sexual orientation, what is gender identity or gender expression is necessary. Many legislations in the region currently talk about gender identity and gender expression when this human right is recognized. It's a fundamental human right. It's a basic right that is the right to a gender identity. Some countries in the region do have it guaranteed by law, others don't, but undoubtedly their international tools and international instruments that consign this right as a human right and it has to be respected in the region. The differences I wish to move on quickly, we're running short in time, with regard to sexual orientation or gender expression. Sexual orientation is who we fall in love with, if you're lesbian or gay or bisexual, and there are many more identities probably. Gender identity refers to our identity construct and all individuals do this sometimes there's an ideal that only trans people construct their gender identity. That's not so. We all construct our gender identity very early on when we are four or five years old. Some psychology literature um, even say since we say who we are, since we express ourselves, we express our gender identity and this gender identity sometimes is constructed in a way that coincides with the gender sex that was assigned to us at the time of our birth. And we are cis persons. And that construct oftentimes doesn't ident uh, coincide with the gender we were assigned at the time of our birth and we're trans people. Some people are considered binary and they don't consider themselves neither masculine that is assigned when we're born or feminine. So we have gender identities that are trans, cis, or non-binary, and probably there are more. The expression of gender is subjective in the way we express ourselves, how we speak, how we dress, that refers to the expression in which we manifest ourselves, but that is absolutely subjective as per the perception people have of us. In different places, if a woman stands in different places in a city or if she comes from one rural region and she comes to the center of the city, it will seem to us that she's not dressed appropriately or she is not very feminine or maybe she looks more masculine. So what we shouldn't do in that sense is, well, try to assume that based on that gender expression, we have an understanding that uh, she has a given sexuality or uh, a different sexual construct. We need to respect the sexual identity of each person. Next slide. And where do our discriminations and oppressions come from that we receive as a LGBT plus community? It has to do to the fact that these political identities we construct, that we visualize and speak of, to express our differences, to express that there are more ways of loving, that there are more identities. It has to do with the fact that there are many ways of expressing our sexuality, as many as people in the world. But the culture we live in influences on us and leads us to present one single, quote unquote, a single normal or healthy way of being that is heterosexual. So that heteronorm leads us to pointing at anything that breaks that paradigm that heteronorm is punished by society. And it's been punished very uh, with a lot of cruelty and violence because identities that are different to, in terms of gender diversity that are different to heteronorm, 
have made us be, be seen as a pathology, as an illness up to the 1990s in the psychiatry manuals, we were seen as a mental disorder. Homosexuality was consigned as a mental illness and trans people are, there are still international manuals that uh, point at dysphoria, gender dysphoria or gender incongruency in the last edition. So transsexuality is still considered an illness, a pathology. There are campaigns and organizations that are requesting to halt this, that trans orientation is depathologized. This is a constant struggle. Argentina has a legislation for mental health that forbids these expressions, but at a global level, we still see them and suffer them. And we've also been considered sinful for some religions, for some religious fundamentalists. They tell us we're an abomination, an aberration. We've been blamed of this pandemic due to our way of being, our relationship, or for the simple fact of being or loving. And we have considered criminals. In the region, in the global map, we still see how many legislations criminalize us because it not only has to do with regulating marriage or um, the application of a legislation on gender identity, it also has to do with legislation that don't recognize us and other laws that expressly recognize us as criminals. In Argentina until 2012, in spite of being so contemporary, there were articles that criminalized homosexuality and transvestites. To move forward, my next slide, please. Something very clear, the violence we suffer in our region, in our identities, for being considered a pathology, a crime, or a sin. There are many scopes of violence, Let's move ahead, please, so we reach the last slide. The scope of violence is very large. Here on the impact of COVID-19, the violence in households is a constant for the LGBT plus community. And this is a violence that we had been suffering before we had already been suffering an impact and a crisis in terms of food and sanitary crisis and uh, also shelter crisis. Even before this pandemic, the trans uh, community is um, thrown out of their homes very early on. International agencies have information in this regard and now we're facing this pandemic that was unforeseen and we still can't estimate at the long term how we will recover from this crisis and this situation was still was bad before and now it's worsened and legislations that arose with regard to preventing the pandemic in terms of lockdowns isolation and protection measures undoubtedly have affected our population, particularly the trans and LGBT plus refugees, like it's the case of Argentina, that has been the weakest link in the chain of impact. That's why we talk about a differentiated impact and it's detected specifically in the trans population in the LGBT community in the region. Affirmative measures have been published and I would like to highlight this. And they have to do with different social programs that have helped and generated a small assistance and um, different food aid, but nowadays they don't suffice. And as months go by, it's worsening and it's not enough with respect to shelters, with respect to food aid and health care. The refugees and the places where our community meets, because particularly in our 
community of refugees, the LGBT plus, these are people that have been persecuted because of hate to their gender identity in their countries. But when they come, for example, to Argentina, they don't meet their diaspora because they will receive the same discrimination due to their sexual identity. So they're refugees that have this particularity that they find themselves alone and they find themselves speaking to other colleagues that have suffered the same persecution and the same uh, story due to discrimination due to sexual identity. Well, here I would like to conclude the, the, the assistance centers. We have the health ministries, they uh, published resolutions that have to do with respect to an equal treatment and the human rights as well. And everyone should be treated in a decent way. And we still need to reinforce those concepts and in light of this, these impacts and this crisis, this tremendous crisis as a pandemic of this magnitude, it's necessary to reinforce and the governments and the states uh, have these, all these provisions published and other things we request to the civil society organizations and the states because we are an axis which tries to close this gap between the civil society and the populations and the state. So this is still a role which we request this to be done at the diversity organization. Uh, to summarize, I will leave these advices or tips that have to do with tools we use when we have a decent or respectful treatment in society, but it's more of a document or a tool. So we continue to work together. And I hope that this is the beginning and the initial launching of a joint work in light of this tremendous pandemic, which is global, in which we all have to be united to collaborate and to try to face in the best way possible. So I thank you for your time and I will conclude, conclude and I pass the uh, microphone. I yield the floor. Thank you, Nuria. Thank you, Flavia. We will now pass the microphone to Amalia Torres and Belen Rodriguez from IOM and Denise Solis from the IFRC and Wilson Castañeda from Red LGBT. They will share experiences and bed practice on gender integration or gender mainstreaming. We will start with Amali, Amaya uh, and Belen. Thank you, Dana. And thank you to Flavia and Nuria for your excellent presentations. I'm Amaya Torres, I work as part of the uh, CCCM in, uh, in Geneva. And today as part of the best practices, I will try to present a project which it, we have been implemented. This is a project we've been implementing over the fast, past five years. Next slide, please. Before going into the details of the proj projects, I wanted to mention the importance of the uh, CCCM participation in this place population and the colleagues who have uh, mentioned some aspects before. I would like to mention that the uh, effective participation of all the displaced population groups is an essential pillar for uh, the quality of the camps and the uh, shelter management because at the end our objective is to provide projection, protection and basic services to a population that has nowhere else to go. And it's very difficult to do this without uh, the uh, participation of the population. In addition to this, the participation is crucial to reduce vulnerabilities related to forced displacement and to reinforce resilience in the affected populations, the fact that people who have left all their belongings, other things, their lives, and 
now they are living at a camp or at a shelter affects their self-esteem and their capacity for autosufficiency in the uh, new situation they will be living. So in the case of the women's group, and which is specifically for our uh, presentation today, women who are traditionally half of the population in these uh, displacements, displacement contexts, they have been, uh, there's a significant lack of participation of these women's in governance structures to, to the displacement context. This and the coordination of shelters throughout the years, we've seen that this situation has perpetuated. And also, in spite of those efforts, we haven't seen or we haven't seen more women present, but we didn't know if this would be translated into an active and effective participation of women. I will give you a case which most of you have seen, and this happened in a displacement shelter or a camp. There is a, a management committee. Usually here the uh, coordination managers, they work so there is equality between these groups. I don't know, you've gone through this situation. We have cases in which a greater number of women than men or women usually tend to speak less and if they talk, if they speak out their opinions or their demands somehow are translated less into actions than in the case if then if they are formulated or expressed by men. So this is what we've usually seen. So they are represented, but they do not have an effective participation. And there another important thing is that traditionally the uh, shelter management or camp management for displaced persons have emphasized on women in formal governance structures. While we all know that in many contexts, these structures have are more informal and they have greater power in decision in the decision making process and women should be represented as well. And finally, to do the link between the participation and the risk in gender based violence, we know that the number of women, uh, the lack of part significant participation of women in these government structures in the uh, displacement context is one of the social factors that contribute to gender-based violence. So to summarize, if we increase self-sufficiency and the decision-making powers for women in displacement context contributes to their well-being, to their health and their perception of security, of safety. And it also has a positive impact on the repercussion on their general conditions. Next slide, please. So having said this, and with all this, this background I've given you, in 2016, IOM and Women's Refugee Commission developed the Women's Participation Project in coordination with the cluster CCM Global. This project, I should say, is a part of a larger project with the final purpose of reducing gender-based violence in displacement context. And concretely, the uh, participatory uh, project is the idea is to allow professionals of CCCM to develop strategies to strengthen women's participation, women's and girls' participations in displacement context. So the objective of, uh, to this end, a toolkit was developed for humanitarian professionals, but also for and it is also available here in this link we have, womenindisplacement.org. Just a uh, administrative parenthesis. If you see this for the, you, you enter the link for the first time, you have to register the first time. So this toolkit, the purpose is to guide throughout the implementation of the project. And I will now explain to you this, uh, the country pilots, uh, the pilot countries were 
Ecuador, Philippines, Iraq, Nigeria, and Southern Sudan. And since then, we've implemented it in other countries as well. Next slide, please. Project implementation phases. Next. So in, I'd like to explain to you very briefly how we implemented the project and how it, it works. In the first phase, the inception phase, is to identify the barriers and opportunities for participation. Not uh, Participation does not mean the same to everyone. So in this first phase, we try to understand the meaning of participation which can be different according to the uh, population group and also to identify barriers and opportunities for the participation of women. This is done through a revision of literature and existing information plus the compilation of first-hand information which will allow us to prepare a report. So this report, this information is gathered uh, with consulting with the community and uh, displaced persons. So this is, gone. we do this through individual interviews, reviewing the methodology. So in the toolkit contains tools to develop these consultations, which take us to uh, drafting a, uh, to having a draft report. Then we look at the barriers and opportunities for women's participation. This information, with this information, we move on to the second phase of the uh, project and we share it with the community that has provided us with this information. We design the strategies that will be implemented. I wouldn't say that we're going to eliminate the barriers, but try to reduce those barriers and make the best of those opportunities we have for women. Uh, eliminating barriers, I would say, is ambitious because there are barriers and types of discrimination at different levels. And we, as in the uh, implementation of the project, we will it will be possible to eliminate all those barriers. But I do believe that with a consistent implementation throughout the years, we have seen significant improvements. And after the design of the strategies, we implement them. And it's important to say that in this project, the first time we implemented it in a, in a certain specific uh, context, the impact of these individual strategies, we saw if there was a non-desired effect after the implementation. After this, we proceeded to go on to the phase which we call ev evidence and learning. We prepare a report. It's uh, similar to the basis report. We look at the impact we've had in the first place, the part women's participation, their perception on their level of participation, and also their perception on their own safety in the camp or shelter. So this phase also provides us with important information on the uh, spaces and it tells us if the actions that are implemented, if they've worked or not, or if we have to modify or adjust them. And as you see, it's a, it's a circular drawing because we move on to another step in our implementation. So, um, as you can see, or you can well imagine, the difference in the countries where we implement this are different. We've, and we've implemented different strategies. What I would like to highlight is that in most of the countries where we've implemented this, there have been activities that uh, have dealt with awareness raising regarding women's protections and other groups, obviously, evidently, not only for women, but also for the rest of the community. And in the second place, activities related to the promotion of economic activities, which usually go hand in hand with information, for example, activities uh, with leadership activities or um, 
very simple uh, management of uh, business management and the fact that we try to improve their infrastructure because sometimes the perception of security with minimum adjustments and aspects dealing with the shelter can improve a lot and which also takes me to uh, point out the participation and security of women in these shelters. Uh, well, I'd like to conclude here. Uh, Wilson will go on to explain. Uh, and there's also more information on COVID we would like to share with you. Belen will be addressing you now. Thank you very much. I don't know if you hear me. Can you hear me? Please confirm if you can hear me. Well, yes, Belen, you're good. Perfect. As Amaya well said, I will present to you the project we have in Ecuador. It took place in 2016 to 2017 in the uh, formal de, de official camps we have in the eh, province of Manaví. Next slide, please. As part of the background, I can say that this experience we want to share with you now uh, took place after a, an earthquake we had in Ecuador, Manaví, Ecuador, where we had a 7.8 degree magnitude which impacted the northeastern coast of Ecuador in April 2016. And this was part of a humanitarian crisis, as you can see the numbers. This was in 2016. We had 663 deaths, 12 persons were missing, and 4,859 wounded. They were injured, and we estimated that 720,000 people were affected by the earthquake and therefore needed humanitarian assistance. We can say that this was the epicenter, was Pedernales, the uh, province of Pedernales in the eh, province of Manabí, where we had around 80,000 people who were displaced and they were living in official camps, informal settlements, and with shelter families in urban and rural settings. Part of the official camps by the, camp, by the government, we also had these informal settlements where we had risky situations, this scope of possibilities possibilities opened even more and not only were they concentrated in the urban sectors but also in rural areas farther away from the city. I think it's important to mention we need to think in the context of the province as such and specifically in this uh, particular uh, district of Pedernales. If we look at the statistics we have, the national statistics regarding gender and violence, we can see that 60.6% .6 of Ecuadorian women had experimented some type of violence, and one out of four has been a survivor of sexual violence. So we needed to uh, give answers to these people, taking into account that, as my previous colleagues mentioned, these uh, asymmetric situations of power uh, were clearly seen in these territories. And in addition to these, uh, the situation in the Manaví province, we have families uh, they have situations in which there are many people living together under one roof, and in this case, they suffer for from gender, uh, gender uh, 
domestic violence and the uh, statistics of uh, pregnant adolescents has grown in the province of Pederna, in the province of Manabí and Pedernales. We see we have ad adolescent girls or women. Uh, they are pregnant and they are only 14. So if we see this, we're not talking about these are pregnancies of adolescents. So by putting things in this particular context, it's important for you to understand the situation we had before the earthquake. And also I'd like to mention that the communities that have been mostly affected by the earthquake were already vulnerable social economic, uh, were already having a uh, specific vulnerable socioeconomic situation and gender violence was a main concern. Okay. Eh, so, also it's important to mention, dijo, and uh, what was said before, said before that in any, in any emergency situation, we need to have any type of emergency situation. These, there are certain factors that contribute to gender violence. They grow exponentially, in which the perception uh, regarding security, dignity, and privacy are seen as a result of uh, the lack of adequate refugee camps, or when we have these shelters that did not have the adequate minimum conditions. And this has happened in many populations that have been affected. And previously, Anya, Anya, the situation of uh, looking into the structures of these camps, these official camps, they were government camps, but we ha also had these shelters out in the roads where we did not have the basic necessary facilities to offer them a respectful or a decent life. So this is all related to gender violence. So the participation of women in the Ecuadorian society in specifically in the coast provinces is not very high. This was one of the uh, factors that we thought were previous to the uh, earthquake scenario. And the participation in decision making by women, the, the spaces for them were minimum or very low. And this was all in a context in the uh, area of Manabí where Mach, uh, machismo or patriarchy where women who told us that they uh, even if my husband beats me, uh, he uh, continues to be my husband. So these were pre-existing stereotypes. Well, well, as to the implementation, as my previous colleague mentioned, we have this toolkit. So, this was done in the month of June 2016. We had a first this pilot study on the uh, displacement camps in Pedernales 1 and Pedernales 2 that somehow define and prepare or organize this strategy. So, this pilot, this stu pilot study was carried out in two camps in uh, in internal displaced people one of them was called divine child divino niño in which it was important to explore how these women lived and perceived their situation children's situation men's situation and adolescent women as well how they lived and participated what was their perception of their participation in these governance structures within the camp and the and their perception, how these women there contribute to their perceptions of uh, girls and uh, women on security. So these camps were led by the army, which is a 
que, que es representativa force, del gobierno, which is, el ejército uh, government representative eh, and the army administered or managed the camps and they were co-led by the MIES, which is a governing entity in terms of protection. So it's important to look at this and see what happened with these armed groups. And when we look at this uh, thoroughly, what one of the recommendations we could and suggestions we could make is that it's important to analyze and look at what happens with these power structures. And also, on the other hand, we had qualitative aspects with which we prepared these strategies. Next slide, please. Well, the uh, key activities that were conducted, which were very important, was uh, uh, training for women. They learned how to prepare uh, crafts such as soap, manufacturing of soap. And this situation uh, gives them a sustained means or for their to improve their standard of living and their economic aspects reinforce this uh, security and their empowerment of women. And we could organize with these women through this uh, manufacturing of soap and of craft soap in the uh, two shelters we had. And they organized uh, a small group, and these women were related to a micro entrepreneurship, uh, including women in this participatory approach. They also received training uh, for accessories, crafts. And this provided them with economic support in the long term. These uh, women uh, received training, workshops for adolescent uh, girls to promote uh, a livelihood means in the future, including cosmetics, aesthetics, fingernail painting, hairdressing, etc. I think it's important to mention that this initiative for, to do this work, there was lots of efforts and we, there was joint uh, emphasis or work with the different blocks. There was a, the establishment of a women's committee which included training with a participatory approach and um, feeding. We we had feedback mechanisms also to be able to look at the different strategies and the uh, workshops with adolescents were very important and participatory in which experiences through the art, through theater, and at the end of these spaces we had um, evenings where all these activities and initiatives could be uh, presented as to uh, awareness raising regarding women, men and adolescents for the, and this together with other agencies based uh, with a gender, uh, gender violence approach and we had leadership workshops and self-esteem for women and girls in the camps and in the shelters and this has definitely contributed to increasing their self-esteem as part of the uh, significant changes we've seen in this study, we look at um, trust and self-esteem and the roles in the camps and, and in their homes. We could evidence an increase in support towards women in spaces in their lives in the camps and the increase in the number of women participating in decision-making processes. So they, these women, they could see that not only were they responsible for the cooking and the children, but also they saw how they could replicate and ass, uh, assign other roles in, the, in addition to the traditional ones, and they can be involved in other 
spaces, the generation of livelihoods as an alternative for future, for their futures, and the women and adolescents and girls, uh, these improvements in the infrastructures of these places was also perceived. They were, had good lighting. They had showers now, and previous to this, they didn't have showers or restrooms, and this gave them greater privacy. As you can see here, I will stop on this slide. These are testimonials of women that participated in the activities where they share feeling more empowered after all these projects. They're better valued and they feel stronger with confidence in themselves knowing that they have this new life project. So undoubtedly, these testimonials for us bear witness to the change that was carried out in them, these positive changes in these women after the project. Next. Las recomendaciones, eh, creo que como ya les había mencionado, I had mentioned before, I think it is important for us to strengthen the capacities of government agencies at the national level that are responsible for the design and operations to consider safety implications before military structures assume responsibilities of managing the camps. This is important to know. Ecuador was not prepared for a situation like an earthquake. So a recommendation would be that we put in place a preparedness phase so these situations don't affect us, don't have such a big impact to know that the military and the police and the military authorities should have a strong preparedness in a rights-based approach. This is a lesson learned because undoubtedly we were able to observe when we implemented the project, a lot of abuse from the military, from the police towards the population, even situations of violence. De favores sexuales para, para entrega de they asked for sexual favors uh, in exchange for delivering kids. So we need to take into account safety concerns of the populations. It's very important. We need to collect information, do a good analysis for a baseline in order to know what path we had before us to increase awareness in the members of the community. Very necessary men, women, adolescents on gender-based eh, violence and next slide please Sin duda alguna, creo que es importante, and eh, promover, of course it is important estas, to estas implement these activities de, that eh, are productive activities for women and get rid of that image we have from a cultural standpoint, from the patriarchal standpoint where women were left for household chores. Now they can be decision makers, they can be entrepreneurs, they can have a business, they can have livelihoods and I think this is where we should be pointing at, taking into account all these initiatives, bearing in mind the capacities, skills, and experiences they have at the local level. And a recommendation, and this is a lesson learned, oftentimes we see that these women, when they participate in these spaces, many of them attend with their children or their grandchildren. So there was a hindrance for them when they attended uh, the workshops because they didn't have anybody to care for their children or grandchildren. So I think it's important to think about spaces for care for children so that this is not a limitation for them, so that they can continue their preparedness and their training, always informing them about their rights and these situations of violence that are sometimes considered natural in the context I just mentioned. That is what I had on my side. So if there are any questions, please, I'm here to respond them. Thank you, Beling. And now we'll hear the floor to Wilson. Sorry, it's our colleague Denise from IFRC. She will share some experiences and good practices too. Hello, oh, good morning, Dana, and thank you all those that are present. 
First of all, we would like to share with you experiences and best practices and introduction to the regional current situation. Thank you, Belen. She shared with us what happened in Ecuador with the earthquake in 2016-17, but now the situation of continuing having people in shelter, which we know is not the best option, it should be the last option, the last resort, it still continues happening. And now we have a huge wave thanks to COVID-19. There are three reasons for that. And we will see how we have relocated people. The first one is the closing of borders that left many families unable to return to their homes. In the case of Bolivia, for example, where we had Bolivian population that wanted to return to their countries and the government shut the borders and they had to put transient spaces so families could reach these transient spaces. We could call them quote unquote shelters. So they pass their quarantine there that where they would have um, medical checkups to see if they had COVID or not. Once they were considered healthy, they were relocated to the different provinces where they belong to for these isolation centers and transit centers were open, not only in Bolivia, this is still happening. It's in Argentina and the border with Uruguay, also a lack of housing or property had left more vulnerable people, namely people that are homeless, have nowhere to go. And in the midst of a pandemic, these homes are the main space for safety. Unfortunately, many families, many people, people that lived in the streets had no homes and governments due to security reasons relocated them in collective center to avoid the dissemination of the virus. But to open these collective centers, they requested uh, assistance from IMO, from the National Red Cross Societies to see how, how these spaces were managed because this was a new experience for them because of the situation with COVID-19. And uh, the last reason why these shelters were open were tropical storms that have been affecting. As you know, this has been a unique year. We've had 20 different cyclones and tropical storms that have affected the zones. Maybe we haven't had a hurricane that has devastated completely, like was the case of 2019 with the hurricane in the Bahamas, but there were tropical storms that caused floodings and severe damage. One example is the case of El Salvador, where families had to be relocated because of the floods in the homes. They had to relocate these families in shelter type spaces or transit centers while families were going back to their homes either to repair them or anyways they had to open up these new spaces so once they're relocated what should we do as people that manage shelters as people who offer a service that is where we have questioned how we reinvent our response and how to adapt it to better respond to COVID-19 next slide please Thank you. One of the best practices at the regional level is to share information amongst national societies. As you know, the International Federation of the Red Cross supports national societies that need this additional assistance when they are forced to provide for an additional assistance especially when it's a new experience for them, such as the case of the Bolivian Red Cross. A best practice has been to share information to ensure that the information we receive is not only at the program level, but we should try to reach out to the volunteers that are in the field with this information. So this is what we're doing. Like this seminar we're having today, we also had one in May, April with the American Red Cross. They have a very good experience in managing shelters. And that's how we've reinforced knowledge, not only on managing shelters, but specifically with an inclusion protection gender approach, bearing in mind the best practices of other partners, people in the field, other colleagues from national um, 
agencies to replicate best practices in the field. This is an image of the response of the Bolivian Red Cross, where the registration process was conducted once people arrived to relocate them in the different tents. The approach, as you see here, was divided into three parts, considering the most vulnerable sectors, that is people with disability. We recommended to identify people with disabilities and do the appropriate adjustments for them. For example, restrooms that should be accessible for them. If there's a person that has difficulties with mobility or if we have children in the different areas, it is important not only to provide areas so children can do recreational activities, but also how can children go to the bathrooms? For many people, this is a minor thing, but the risk that can be generated to be in a shelter with foreigners for children is a very high risk. To accompany them is what is recommended. When there is a child that's going to a, a bath space is important. And for women and other vulnerable groups to ensure there are safe spaces and trained staff to provide psychological care, primary spiritual care, and to derive them to other partners to refer them if need be. We have different organizations participating, such as the Civil Defense of the Government, IMO, for managing shelters, Red Cross supporting in logistics and management and save the children can be in the same zone. What we've tried to do in the field is to divide the level of responsibilities in order to provide an appropriate service to each of the sectors that existed in the shelter and to allow people in the shelter to participate in decision-making processes on how to manage the tents, how to organize the restrooms, meals. There are some minor things that go beyond managing shelters, such as a line for meals. It is important to consider this in decision-making processes, to consider people living in the shelters, to listen to the voice of men and women in the decision-making processes. Next slide, please. Perfect. These are the strategies that have been carried out by the partners in Bolivia. They are still supporting in the borders at the request of the government. They're working jointly with IMO. The first one has been to prioritize health and safety of volunteers and their surroundings. We need to consider that now we have COVID-19 and the safety of people that are at the forefront is as important that people they're caring for. In order to give a good response, we need to make sure that they have insurance, that they can provide the appropriate services to optimize spaces, to reduce risks in case of having children, to have recreational areas where children have a space in order to carry out recreational activities. If they're women or pregnant women, for example, that they can have spaces where they can feel comfortable. If we have people that have been identified with COVID-19, there should be areas for isolation previously identified so we can take send them to a healthcare center and also consider that inside the camps, there should be public health staff or people from the government uh, to care for these people. The other point is to reinforce communication for key messages. Oftentimes when we start managing and coordinating shelters, we think that if we share people what the norms are, that suffices. But you need to do reminders throughout all the management and coordination process. Um, the key messages, for example, non-violence, non-discrimination, good use of restrooms, hand washing. There are many key messages that you need to continuously repeat throughout the cycle when they register in the cycle until it's closed. And finally, the work should be carried out considering the skill sets of the staff. Maybe our staff in the field is new, and one of the most important points is to ensure that this new staff 
even if they're in a learning process, they need to continue working, uh, learning and giving them the appropriate tools and guidelines for what they need to consider throughout the whole process, beginning through end and also train them. While offering a service, they're learning while they practice, but in turn, it is important and always has been important to ensure that volunteers that are providing this service are trained so their services are provided in a timely manner and that they can cover all the aspects, including protection, gender, and safety. Next slide. And finally, general recommendations and good practices from Bolivia, as well as the American Red Cross, or Hawaiian Red Cross, Argentinian Red Cross, that are caring for shelters, maybe not directly managing, but always providing some service, either by providing kits or others, to provide guidelines in order to care for an emergency, to train staff, as I mentioned before, keeping communication and constant interaction with the leaders in the shelters. And here, the leaders in the shelter groups, it's recommended to include women as leaders so that they are participating in decision-making process, to coordinate with specific partners and topics related to food for boys and girls, legal assistance, training for staff at the local level, national and regional levels. The way in which a collective center or a shelter is planned and managed will have repercussions in the recovery capacity of those that are affected as well as in their access to assistance and protection. We have to think that when somebody participates or starts living in a shelter, somehow their life has been affected, there's a change in their life and the psychological damage they're suffering has to be taken into account from the beginning. It's very important the type of assistance we provide people in this sense. And finally, to identify essential activities in the collective center with existing resources and continuity plan of activities with a minimal staff. This means that vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19, all the activities that are non-essential should be stopped or postponed in order to try to consider social distancing. That is a key factor that should be considered to ensure that everyone in the shelter has a positive health from the beginning to the end. That's what I had for you and I yield the floor to Dana. If there are any questions, remember to write them in the chat. Thank you very much, Denise. We now yield the floor to Wilson, who's part of the LGBTI network. Good morning or good afternoon for those of you that are in different time zones. Thank you for inviting the network for this conversation that is very important for all of us in the understanding that human mobility has generated many challenges as a social movement, both in exercising our work as civil society, as well as with the interaction with the state. I'll share with you some best practices we have found in Latin America and the Caribbean regarding shelters for LGBTI plus migrants and refugees. This is a timely conversation because precisely before the pandemic, UNHCR had convened the LGBT movement of the Americas in the framework of a meeting we had of our network in Quito to talk about any challenges the region would have in terms of shelter for the LGBT community. We saw this in two angles. One, the urgency to care for particular conditions LGBT communities have that are in mobility, and secondly, how to integrate the LGBT agenda with the mobility agenda, because there is a fear that if you have to cater for specific uh, 
needs, we need to have a cohesive approach to guarantee non-exclusion and non-discrimination to people based on their gender identity or expression. And there are three reflections before sharing the successful experiences I would like to refer to and that we've discussed in the network. The first one has to do with experiences in terms of shelters that have naturalized in their structure certain practices that are seen as excluding homophobic and transphobic. So we also said that this not only means to expand a refugee and say that this center, this um, shelter is appropriate. We need to revise internally the expression, sometimes involuntarily expressions of discrimination and exclusion are being replicated. Secondly, we need to understand that there are lessons learned since the strength of the network is in the South of Latin America and the Southern part of Latin America, there's a more advanced experience in South South approach Argentina and Uruguay with experiences in human mobility, but it's novel for the northern part of South America, specifically Colombia and Ecuador, more advanced in the south of North America, thinking about Mexico, for example. So there are two novel challenges for the LGBT community. But in other areas of the region, we've made progress, sometimes with experiments that have, are successful. And we would like to share the experience of the migrant caravans that move towards the US and the process that has been generated in Mexico with shelters and success stories of Argentina and Uruguay in this regard. Third, to note that there is a big challenge, usually bordering areas Although in Latin America and the Caribbean, there are advantages like those shared by um, the um, Red Cross Federation Argentina shared. You know, because of our political structure, advancements are oftentimes national and they are given more in urban spaces. And borders in Latin America and the Caribbean are rural. Usually they live in precarious conditions where the recognition of the rights of LGBT people are even more precarious and migrants and refugees that are LGBT have to face exclusion and discrimination, stigmas, and these are their initial uh, migration experience. And this has to be considered for LGBT migrants and refugees. As you know, and my colleagues of the Federation were quite emphatic in this sense, uh, the LGBTIQ plus suffers a phenomenon of a political and structural order. It's uh, an acronym that comprises many realities, especially in terms of shelter and the experiences in host centers and shelters. There are two major needs. One that has to do with trans women and men, but more with trans women by the enunciation of gender they have, and sometimes they're restricted in these shelters. And second, because many people that move through Latin America living with HIV and the experience of stigma they have to suffer. So from this point, I will briefly share with you seven success stories we've had in the network in Latin America and the Caribbean and five challenges. I would like to begin with the first experience and it's called the Lambda experience. The seven experiences I will share with you are from the civil society. And unfortunately, it has to do with a moratorium of the governments in Latin America and the Caribbean to respond to the LGBT agenda. We still do not have a structure. Some advancement has been made, particularly in Argentina and Uruguay, but in general terms in Latin America and the Caribbean, we don't have a state structure that responds to human mobility of LGBT people and international agencies that do this have opted for having a non-discriminatory or exclusion approach, but there's no concrete specialty to face 
the challenge for shelters for LGBT people. So these seven experiences are from the civil society, of course, with the support of the UN agencies and international cooperation, and fortunately with the support of the state in some cases. First of all, I will share with you the Lambda experience in Guatemala on the bordering experience between Guatemala and Mexico. Lambda is an LGBT organization that initially had a great demand of attention with HIV AIDS and from its foundation before 2010, it was a committed organization to prevent discrimination and stigma due to HIV. But in a seven instance starting 2010, because of the migratory phenomenon suffered by Guatemala, especially in the migration caravans with many LGBT people, especially from Honduras, that were moving in these caravans that required a special attention. So a mobility process began and a response from civil society with a Lambda uh, shelter th that is in Guatemala in the border with Mexico on the southern border. And basically there is a process for care for LGBT people that has a special characteristic that is with community work. Lambda is betting at being a process from the civil society created within the framework of uh, facing this pandemic with the HIV and all their best practices in community work is applied to the pandemic of HIV AIDS and human mobility thanks to the experience at the community level that has three components. One, a temporary refuge or shelter where people can spend some time, a residence that uh, has better service provision and assistance for transit to mitigate the challenges of their movement and third, physical and psychosocial support. Second, we continue with a presentation, please. Next slide. There's an experience that has been very positive. That's an experience in Rio de Janeiro led by groups of feminist lesbian women in order to respond to a growing phenomenon of a migration in Rio de Janeiro, especially in trans and lesbian and bisexual women, that in addition to suffering xenophobia, they also suffer from homophobia, transphobia, and lesbophobia that was being um, deepened in Rio de Janeiro. As you know, local governments have not been favorable in Rio to the LGBT plus community. And what they're doing in partnership with some cooperation agencies is to identify some houses in Rio de Janeiro, some family households of people that are passing through a poor economic situation and they offer their homes as refugees or shelters. And these feminist groups provide courses for families, like a sort of Airbnb, and to propose them as a space. These are homes that are certified, that respect, that are uh, familiar with the LGBT uh, groups, and to have cooperation spaces in order to pay for rent so the migrants and refugees can live there. They're not going to the refugees or shelters that are usually managed by the state and there are restrictive practices, particularly to, for trans women. And they go to these homes where their families are trained. On one hand, they cater for the housing needs, especially for lesbian women that are coming to Rio and to provide for a home that respects and accompanies LGBT women. And it's a good practice for uh, these communities uh, that are hosts. For me, it's a good practice. They're caring for the person that is seeking for a refugee and transforming the host communities and um, demythifying the homophobia. 
The third experience we found in the network is the Casa Miga in Brazil. It's located in Manaus. This is a shelter that existed for some time now, coordinated by an organization called Manifiesta. It's part of the network. In the case of Casa Miga, they were a space that already existed. As you know, Manaus is a bordering territory of Brazil, both with Colombia as well as Venezuela. And it's a highly uh, selvatic, it's a, a jungle. And this was something that, that already existed in Manaus for LGBT that uh, were displaced from their homes. And in recent years, since it was a bordering city, it starts receiving many requests from citizens in human mobility and is doing this transformation to become a place for shelters for LGBT. And Casa Amiga has three virtues in the region. But first of all, he it has articulation strategies with organizations that Manal inclusion in the uh, health system and we can connect these people who arrive at this place with their workspaces because if Casa Amiga is a place where they can simply go for a brief period of time because it's a house with many people very quickly Casa Amiga is uh, conducting action so that this period is brief and therefore they can go to work or in uh, spaces where they can improve their quality of life. The second good thing they have is that this uh, mobility phenomenon has always existed. They can articulate in a space for hosts and it means a house of people, LGBT people in the middle of many homes or houses of Brazilian people and this, and there is a uh, campaign of trying to avoid these uh, discrimination campaigns and we recognize that Casa Amiga from the network is a small experience. Casa Amiga in Manaus is a house which uh, survives with very well administered resources with a, a local organization and it can be an example of uh, they have a demand in, in LGBT population which still do not find a structural response. Let's go on to the next good practice we found. This is a practice which we found in Ecuador which uh, in which it is displaced through uh, in many parts of Ecuador. It's my house out of my home. And this is an initiative of the Diverse Dialogue in Ecuador. It's an experience that even though it does not have the traditional characteristics of a refugee under the understanding that this is not a home that shelters permanently LGBT uh, refugee and displaced people uh, with the understanding that they do not have the um, uh, housing infrastructure. This My House Out of My House is an initiative that took place in Ecuador because they have a significant movement of people from Venezuela because it has a dollarized economy. So this migratory flow, we start to identify LGBTI people or population with the arrival of these migrant and refugee population, the LGBTI uh, Ecuadorian uh, uh, groups start trying to help them. It's a center where people arrive and people are referred to other centers. So it works, it, it serves as a good hosting experience if we would like to put it that way because if we do not have the um, hosting service, when we think of shelters for LGBTI groups, when they arrive in uh, cities such as Quito, they don't have uh, homes. This is like an organization in the sense that it provides 
an auxiliary attention or care. And what they do is that they contact other existing shelters in the country that have been trained and have an expertise regarding LGBTI people. So it can be an option for them. Let's move on to the next experience. This is our local experience. It call, it, it's called uh, Affirmative Caribbean Project. It works uh, similarly to what Casa Fuera de Casa, the way they work. It's in Colombia and ex expertise has been the LGBTI people of all this situation we are living now in Colombia and has to do with the uh, peace building experience. In these border areas, we have migrant citizens, mainly Venezuelans, because we are in places that communicate or border regions, border areas near the trails uh, between Colombia and Venezuela, where we have people in precarity situations, but also they are binationals. They work in Colombia to look for work and then they go back to Venezuela. So that's helped us. That is why it's called Integra, integration, uh, with the understanding that the citizens we are assisting or caring for is that we are helping them because we try to guarantee their rights and at the same time helping them with their mobility depending on their uh, sexual expression so they are not affected by discriminatory practices and avoid or prevent them from uh, them being related to extreme violence because you know that in Colombia we are going through a peace agreement process and it has concerned us that there is a high level or an increase in criminality and we have refugees and displaced uh, trans women and this is how we manage through a uh, permanent accompanying uh, system. We try to help them to avoid re-victimization. So let's move on to our next experience. Casa Abierta, Open House in Costa Rica. This is an organization of the civil society. This is a host community, which is the result of the civil society for migrants and refugees. You know that in Costa Rica, we have many uh, Nicaraguans, Hondurans in a lesser degree and uh, Panamanians also, of people who see in Costa Rica a better country to live in for their quality of life and this LGBTI community because in countries such as Honduras has very high levels of criminality and violence and this is a phenomenon in terms of costs which is better for them than instead of going to the north to North America to the United States so it is significant so Costa Rican had a very high degree of um, of um, understanding and over the last few years due to this displacement into Costa Rica these offers have started to close and there's been a group of citizens which had arrived in Costa Rica earlier on so they had this experience or they had created this open house in Costa Rica in which LGBTI citizens uh, persons coming to Costa Rica found that they had no um, where to stay. This is a temporary shelter which allows migrant LGBTI persons to make relations or to relate with other um, groups or communities to provide them with help and uh, taking advantage that Costa Rica has signed many agreements and compacts of uh, guaranteeing LGBTI rights and they are uh, generating jobs and education opportunities. So I would like to highlight that this has been a wonderful experience that has taken place in the border between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. They've created a significant group of women in the area of Naranjas and uh, these are migrant and refugee women, which in addition to improving their quality of life because they were rural women in Nicaragua and Honduras, and they continue being rural women, there's been a transformation of these host uh, 
uh, spaces. So let's move on now to our last experience, which I would like to mention. It's the whole center in the border of Tijuana. It's a binational experience in the in California, in the border between uh, Mexico and the U.S. It's on the uh, U.S. border with uh, community care centers for LGBTI people. This exists since the 1980s due to the uh, social movements in California but with the uh, migratory flow from Central Americans and Mexicans particularly to the U.S. on this Tijuana border, such as El Paso borders, they're very porous. These are community centers which start specializing in LGBTI groups, and these are groups that are uh, subscribed. They have mobile services, and together with the Colegio Mayor de Mexico in the Tijuana borders, start providing services regarding health, legal, and psychosocial care in these border areas and these are uh, caravans when they are already in Mexico and they uh, transit or go to the US they are accompanied by these mobile groups and as soon as they get into the US they can be receive shelter in these spaces that are called community centers and these are spaces or areas which are governed by the US government which demand a certain statutory uh, status. So they've managed to negotiate their status. This is the Tijuana experience where they are managed to stay, to remain at a, a border area and they've managed to stay here and uh, they do not have the Californian authorities uh, intruding or impacting on them. So these are some of the experiences we've had and I'd like to emphasize on the fact that we, this is an, uh, pro, we are undergoing an exploration, ex, an exploratory process. We have a challenge to move ahead with our good practices. And my next slide, please. These are other ways of good practices. This challenge we have ahead when we think of host centers, this is a conversation we had already started at a gathering we had regarding shelters for LGBTI people. We indicated with some of the uh, these movement group um, the way when we were sharing what things we were doing. These are five challenges we have ahead. And when we ask ourselves, what should we do? Because people ask us, should we have special shelters for LGBTI groups or can we use the uh, shelters we already have? So this is some of the discussion we've had regarding this. So we answered them with five uh, items or five bullets. I like to mention uh, in a particular way that the experience the in Brazil, because the great challenge we have ahead, and we've talked about this with many organizations that pay this, uh, provide this service, is that there is lots of resistance from the shelter to share people with LGBTI people and there's lots of resistance in the shelter to have LGBT people because their uh, rights uh, infrastructure they have which is very sensitive and the Brazilian experience is quite sensitive because it achieves to respond to a need we have it's a it's a host space for LGBT migrants and refugees at a shelter but at the same time it is transforming this this uh, mix this social mix so when we have homes receiving trans or gay or lesbian or we are transforming my social space and that not only guarantees their space of migrants and refugees but there is a social uh, space where we can uh, trans combat or fight against 
this very sensitive issue. The next item has to do with the accompaniment of a gender focus to migratory caravans in Mexico, in uh, Peru and Ecuador. We have uh, accompanied people from Venezuela. These LBG, LGBT groups that migrate, they are looking for a space for uh, recognition of their human rights. So in Colombia, there are still some items to resolve. Same thing happens in, in Ecuador. So how do we manage to understand that LGBT people are still striving for better qualities of life in these processes? And these uh, groups in Mexico, it's significant to understand shelter as a mobilized uh, opportunity or space. In the third place, a special accompaniment, particularly the two groups which are more vulnerable are trans women under the understanding that in many countries of the region, trans women are sexual workers. I know it's a topic for discussion and this is not the right place to talk about it, but we need to work about revictimization of trans women and women with HIV in Latin America. The prevalence of HIV is increasing again. And the next item is how we understand the mixed care in uh, migratory centers because mo they mostly take place in border areas. So uh, if we have an optimum, if we uh, uh, respond, if we articulate with Panama or Venezuela, this uh, border uh, space so that this mobility will not make us lose the work we've already achieved, the good thing we've already done. And another experience we have with the Caribbean is the concern of the intersection Sectorality uh, migration also undergoes a situation of economy, access to resources, and there is an exercise that is being carried out by the Haitian. There is an intersectionality and racial situation, but also we ask ourselves when we have the LBGT groups and the ethnical and racial groups and this, we need to have a reflection regarding the sexual orientation and the experience it takes place under the understanding that intersectorality, uh, we are facing challenges, there is a plurality in people and this is some of the things we are facing at these uh, shelters and host communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wilson. Thank you very much for your valuable contributions in today's webinar. To conclude, uh, we'd like to thank you. We have some time constraints. We will pass the microphone to Evelyn and Nicholas. We can't hear you, Evelyn. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry, okay. Well, uh, I would like to thank you for being here with us and to be on time, specifically on what you see on the screen are the tools which the IFRC has developed for the uh, to put in place in your territories and in principle and align with the standards and norms of other organizations. These are the uh, minimum standards related to protection, gender and inclusion. We have a particular specific chapter for management, uh, for shelter management, and on the other hand, and complementing these minimum standards, we have a toolkit to provide support not only on the different fields or domains, but also to decision-making people regarding response to, rapid response to needs, to PGI needs for sectors. And we have a checklist to see if the uh, sectors are complying with these minimum standards. We have a scorecard. We see that there is a question from a colleague from Bolivia. We can contact Denise to provide technical support. 
And within the framework of COVID, we have established some recommendations, particular recommendations for adaptation to COVID virus in these collective areas. These recommendations have already been addressed by Denise and they are focused not only on training, we have training, but also adequation. And on the other hand, as was already mentioned, we conducted together with the Argentinian Red Cross recommendations for the in gender inclusion at the uh, Technopolis Hospital. As we mentioned, uh, due to time constraints, I will include all the links for the tools, the toolkits and the uh, Red Cross and any other group that might be interested to provide. I will provide then all our contact info. I will pass the uh, microphone to Nicholas for the final remarks. Thank you. Bye. Muchísimas gracias, Evelyn. Thank Creo que, bueno, you very much, Evelyn. Ahora, como bien mencionaban los colegas, As our que, colleagues eh, las respuestas well seguiremos dándolas a través del Q&A. Through the Q&A que tenemos ahí en, the Q &I en la chat aplicación de Zoom. We have Yo simplemente the era darles las gracias a todos por, por, like por habernos acompañado, por el tiempo que han estado con nosotros, por, 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 por aguantar un poco que nos pasó un poco de la hora. Eh, well, y, y rescatar uh, esto que están haciendo los colegas, digamos, de que todavía uh, el tema de la inclusión plena de género en la respuesta humanitaria, y sobre todo el tema de albergues, es una deuda pendiente. Uh, eh, sobre todo en la región han escuchado algunas críticas que han compartido los diferentes exponentes. Shared, uh, we've listened to the different uh, speakers, and we just wanted to stress the commitment of this group that is working on gender and mainstreaming. So, Dana, I'll pass the microphone to you for final remarks. Thank you, Nicholas. We have we have two specific questions. We will ask Miguel Medrano to please register on our assistance list if he hasn't done so before. So we can send you all the answers to the questions regarding the Bolivia contact and also how to address. Flavia mentioned a uh, guideline which helps us, which has very useful uh, items and this we will share with you as well and also some others which are very useful to address uh, viol uh, gender violence and other questions you've made. Thank you very much to you all. Here we have our gender tools and uh, this was done in our round table. We have a uh, we have a manual on humanitarian action. We have a uh, brochure on gender keys for sanitary emergency response. This was prepared. We also have another uh, work that was prepared by the Guatemalan group. We have a, we have the gender and age indicator. We would like to leave you before we close with the commitment of building and manage and let's coordinate shelters with a gender approach to have people, uh, places that are safe for all of us, that will not promote or discriminate, places where we have security, dignity, and privacy for all people with no, uh, regardless of any conditions and spaces where everybody can participate in the decision-making process and also in providing services and places that promote individual autonomy and places in which differentiated measures, specific measures are taken to address specific needs of all the people there, taking into account their vulnerability conditions, diversity conditions, and in response for those who coordinate and manage the shelters. Thank you to you all. We will share this webinar by email as well as all the material. Thank you all for the experts who've attended. And this is a tremendous recognition for your work, the Red Cross as well, and IOM and our colleagues of you and women with whom we've been here at the uh, round, gender round table promoting this space.
have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Muchas gracias. Que tengan todas y todos una muy buena tarde. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. Have a nice day.